So what does artificial intelligence look like? And what does it have to do with design and architecture? Turns out, a lot. And if we ask what AI looks like, this is typically what we see. If you plug artificial intelligence into Google image search, you get images like this, or this, with the head and the eyes and the earth, the hand. This is Cyborg Lady, and I think this is jQuery. It's a scary vision of the future. Of course, we get movies, right? We get Minority Report. This is Joaquin Phoenix downloading his girlfriend operating system. Remember this? Number five is Alive, the movie Short Circuit from the 80s, Robot Sidekicks. Or the Fembot from Ex Machina. And of course, Al. And what's worse is the cliches get, get even more terrible. AI is the new black, MIT Technology Review wants us to know. AI is the new UI. Artificial intelligence is the next digital frontier, is what McKinsey wants us to know. Andrew Ng told us that AI is the new electricity. But now he's saying maybe that AI is the new MOOC, or Massively Oriented Online Course, about building an, an AI-powered society. The future of computers is the mind of a toddler or a really creepy disembodied head. Google's AI is a new paradigm that unites humans and machines. And Elon Musk, who tells us that tech moguls are declaring an era of artificial intelligence. And that's all good. But AI isn't the new anything, because AI isn't new. So how new is AI? Well, let's look back to 1955, when John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence. And he described it as making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by people. He gathered a group of scientists and um, psychologists and engineers together over a summer in New Hampshire at Dartmouth. And they got together to put in place the platform of research for artificial intelligence. And when he sent out his invitation to his colleagues in 1956, he said, every aspect of learning or any feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. <clears throat> and actually, these ideas are even older. Um, the, co the notion of machine learning was popularized by Arthur Samuel in 1952. And here you see him playing checkers. It turned out that all the moves in the game of checkers were outlined in a set of books, which made for a good data set to feed to this computer. And that's how the notion of machine learning was first born and popularized. And so he said, the programming of a digital computer to behave in a way which, if done by human beings or animals, would it be described as involving the process of learning. These, these individuals were professors at my university, at Carnegie Mellon, Herb Simon, Alan Newell, uh, and J.C. Shaw. And what they said of game playing in artificial intelligence is that intuition, insight, and learning are no longer exclusive possessions of humans. Any large high-speed computer can be programmed to exhibit them also. They thought they would have the problem solved by about 1961. J.C.R. Licklider who is a very important figure who funded a lot of things at DARPA, the Defense um, Advanced Research Projects Association, a professor at MIT and a private contractor, described an idea of man-computer symbiosis. And this, this concept of human-computer symbiosis is one we still use today when we want to talk about intellect and artificial intelligence. And of course, Marvin Minsky, who said that he believed we were on the threshold of an era that will be dominated, that will be strongly influenced and quite possibly dominated by intelligent problem-solving machines in 1961. Take that, Elon Musk. I want to point out, though, in this process that AI and design are not strangers. In fact, they're friends, and at that, they're old friends. And I want to branch into this discussion of where, I, where AI loosely came from into what happened when architects and designers took it up. 
First of all, we could take this person. This is, of course, Douglas Engelpart, and doing this is the mother of all demos in 1968. But if you, and you might, you might also know him, of course, as the person who invented the mouse. This is the first mouse in 1964. It's kind of the Scandinavian model. It's wood, and it's got some nice hand hewnness to it. But in 1961, his go-to place to talk about artificial intelligence was an architect. And he, he described an augmented architect at work, saying he sits at a working station that has a visual display screen some three feet on a side. This is his working service, and it's controlled by a computer from which he can communicate by means of a small keyboard and various other devices. <clears throat> In this demo that I showed you very briefly, the mother of all demos where he showed a hyperlinked online computer system in the 1960s, this is the idea he had in mind, and it's much the, sim much the same as computer-aided design programs we use today. Why architecture? Because architecture is about building worlds. Design's about building worlds, and for that matter, AI is about building worlds. So let's now talk about two architects who were really great at doing this. <clears throat> the first is Nicholas Negroponte, who you might know as the founder of the MIT Media Lab. You may not have known that he was an architect, but he is an architect by training. And the second is someone named Cedric Price, who you may not know about. Both of them were architects in the 60s and 70s who were working with cybernetics and artificial intelligence in some really vital ways that gave us ideas about what responsive buildings and what interfaces to artificial intelligence could look like. I'll start with Negroponte. This is Nicholas Negroponte, many of his, his images. Um, in 1970, when he was barely, barely an MIT professor, he wrote a book called The Architecture Machine. And in it, he, he dedicated the book to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. I'll point out, you always get a lot of gestures with Negroponte. His hands sneak in the picture all the time. He worked with a group called the Architecture Machine Group at MIT, and this was the predecessor to the Media Lab. This group existed from 1967 to 1984, when it just became a part of the MIT Media Lab, when that was begun. And together with this group, part architects and part engineers, he worked very closely with the AI Lab at MIT, with Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, to design interfaces for artificial intelligence. Marvin Minsky again, who we saw earlier. And I want to point out something really important at that time. The majority of this research at MIT was funded by the Department of Defense, and in particular, two different bodies, the Information Processing Technology Office and the Office of Naval Research. And very few people worked within this small little universe of artificial, artificial intelligence funders. So it was a very small group of people putting in place the research agenda for AI. So again, Marvin Minsky. Um, and you'll notice here, if you look at this, this um, robotic arm stacking blocks, you see that the, art of, uh, the architecture machine group worked quite closely with, um, with the AI lab. This is a project that they did in 1970 called Seek. And it took place at the software show um, at the Jewish Museum. This is a major show about electronic art. And if you look closely in this picture right here, you'll see mirrored blocks and a robotic arm that would stack them. And you'll see something else, gerbils. Do you see them? They're right up there, little heads peeking out. And if you look closely, right here it says, gerbils match wits with computer built environment. You can kind of see more of what's going on on the right. And Seek did what a robotic arm trained to stack blocks would do, which is stack blocks. And the gerbils did what gerbils do, which is move the blocks around, make homes, make a mess. This is from the gatefold of the software catalog, Life in a Computerized Environment. And I want to point out that the software show was a total disaster in many ways, and so was Seek. We might remember what Ted Nelson wrote in that catalog. He said, our bodies are hardware our behavior, software. And that was really true for the gerbils because Seek tended to kill them. Later on, 
the Architecture Machine Group began building immersive environments that were intended for command and control purposes and experiments of remote surveillance. This is a project called Aspen Movie Map, which looks kind of like what you think it does. They took a Jeep, they attached movie cameras to it, and they sent it through the streets of Aspen, Colorado, gathered images, put them on a video disc, as in the big video discs that you put into the video disc player, and then you could zoom down the streets of Aspen, Colorado, sitting in an Eames lounge chair with joysticks. It is that strange. Other things they created, mapping by yourself. This is a Westinghouse window. Um, this is 1977. Um, I like the fact that in the background that although it looks like an iPad, there's an IBM Selectric typewriter and also a push button phone. But this was intended to be, this was actually the first layered digital mapping system, um, I believe, that existed. And this was intended to substitute for all the maps that someone might have in the battlefield. And I want to point this out because it was necessary to align these projects with defense funding in order to get them funded at that point. You couldn't do it as basic research, so they had to have a military application. Negroponte, I think, better than most people understood what was at stake in designing for artificial intelligence. And in another book he wrote called Soft Architecture Machines, he said, the fantasies of an intelligent and responsive physical environment are too easily limited by the gap between the technology of making things and the science of understanding them. I strongly believe that it is important to play with these ideas scientifically and explore applications of machine intelligence that totter between being unimaginably oppressive and unbelievably exciting. And that's what he had to say in 1975. So with the Architecture Machine Group, this mix of engineers and architects working on interfaces to AI, we see defense funding at play, and yet we see fantastic research that set in place some of the foundations of interactivity and AI that we use today. And we also see the dark side of it. We see where, it's ex where, where it is oppressive and exciting. <clears throat> now I'd like you to meet Cedric Price. Cedric Price is a British architect who died in 2003. If you've ever known of Archigram, he was good friends with them. He was someone who you don't know for building very much because he didn't believe in building very much. He'd tell his clients, maybe you need a walk in the park. Maybe you need a divorce. You don't need a new house. He belonged to the British Demolition Society as well as the Royal Institute of British Architects. And what I love about this man is he had a different way of thinking about things. So the London Zoo, this is, if you've been to the London Zoo, um, you might know the structure, the aviary. He thought that maybe you could put this structure down and the birds would stay. Maybe you could take it off. Maybe they'd stay. Mm, not. <laughs> He's probably best known for another unbuilt project. In fact, everything I'm going to show you next has not been built called the Fun Palace, which he worked on with the British radical theater director named Joan Littlewood. She was a protege of Bertolt Brecht. And they wanted to create a movable, um, dynamic, learning and fun center, um, parts theater, parts exhibition, part whatever you'd want to do with it. And they called it the Fun Palace. And they also had a large cybernetic committee working with them on the Fun Palace. And if you look closely at this, you'll see right here in the middle, Input of unmodified people, and then actual network, and then output of modified people. So they believed, they believed that the interaction would be cybernetic, would change the people, and the people would change through working through, through moving through this structure, and that maybe it would learn from them over time. He worked closely with a British cyberneticist named Gordon Pask. So did Nicholas Negroponte, I want to add. And what I find so interesting about this is that it's a very different notion than we tend to have about design. We usually think we want our computers to do what we tell them to. Well, what if they don't? And that was something that they began to play with. So as Pask said, let us turn the design paradigm in upon itself. Let us apply it to the interaction between the designer and the system she designs rather than the interaction between the system and the people who inhabit it. Where do you put that feedback loop of creativity? Pask wanted to explore and play with that. 
In 1976, Cedric Price began working on a project called Generator that was supposed to be located in Georgia, the state of Georgia um, in the United States. This was an arts retreat center, and it involved a lot of cubes, you know, 12 foot tall cubes, walkways, catwalks, barriers, and you could do whatever you wanted with, this, with these cubes in this area. Put them together for whatever purposes you'd like. And he had a way of coming up with menus to imagine how they might be laid out, each of which kind of reads like a story. If you look closely here, you'll see, very good, walk around to all the angles. You can imagine that this is supposed to be some kind of exploration. Always a mobile crane would come and move the cubes and put them down. These are from the archive, and these are sketches of uh, Cedric Price's. It would come together kind of like this. The pieces come down in a grid, they're held together, and then bit by bit, people can put on the stairs, hang out until they decide to move it again. But Price realized that it was actually pretty unlikely that people were going to move around their architecture like he wanted them to. So this is why he started working with John Frazier in 1978 and Julia Frazier. Um, and they came up with a set of computer programs and microcontrollers that were supposed to be a part of Generator. And the idea would be that, as you can see here, this is a plotter. You could design what generator does. The computer would know the rules of what generator could do. But if you didn't move them, if you didn't move the parts, if you didn't redesign it, generator would run a boredom program. It would get bored. And then it would come up with new layouts and hand them off, and generator would move around. And as John Frazier wrote to Cedric Price, if you kick a system, the very least that you would expect it to do is kick you back. And he said in a postscript to a letter he wrote to Cedric Price, you seem to imply that we were only useful if we produced results that you did not expect. I think this leads to some definition of computer aids in general. At least one thing that you would expect from any half-decent computer program is that you should, ex you should produce at least one plan which you did not expect. This is considered to be the first intelligent building. And one of the things that you see in Cedric Price's work and Negroponte's work is a concept of generativity, that it comes up with things that we didn't start with, right? That are beyond us. And sometimes it kicks you back. Something that he said later um, was designing for delight and pleasure should very seldom seem to be, be seen to happen and must encompass indeed nurture doubt, danger, mystery, and magic. And in an age of stranger danger and concern about um, interactions with the world, I like the fact that this might actually open things up a little bit. I want to ask a question, which is, how do we know intelligence when we see it? We know that if we look at Google image search, that we get cyborgy looking heads and ladies and apparently jQuery. If you ask Google, AI invents, this is what it fills in. AI invents language, recipes, its own language. Google invents AI. No, it didn't. The future of robot communication, Facebook's AI bots accidentally invent a new language while trying to learn to negotiate with one another. And it was shut down <clears throat> because it was, it was viewed as too dangerous. We didn't have insight into the black box. This AI learned to predict the future by watching loads of TV. They could figure out when someone was going to hug, kiss, or high five with 40% 40 uh, 40 accuracy, 43%. It's a lot of Scrubs, Ugly Betty, and Big Bang Theory to produce that knowledge. Maybe you know Janelle Shane's work. Um, she's my favorite person who plays with neural nets for fun. She fed a paint, uh, she fed a neural net a number of names of paints and paint formulas. And it comes up with these names, names like navel tan, burf pink, dope, stoner blue, bank butt and uh, turdly, and burbel simp are some of my favorites. Um, this I saw last night. She's, we have Thanksgiving this week in the United States, so she's come up with some uh, recipes again. These are for Thanksgiving, things like baked trance pie or florid pumpkin pie, taco mince pie maybe. She came up with guinea pig names, 
Her neural net has Hanger Dan and Princess Pow. This is Dan Hahn's set of British place names, some of which are not safe for work. And Sunspring is a film where a particular uh, neural net took in a number of uh, science fiction scripts and then actually this, this was actually performed and it's a nine minute film that you can find on YouTube. It's bizarre. So why am I telling you about this? Because I think these, these different kinds of projects that are goofy and weird um, bring around a notion of irony and humor and satire. And they challenge what is sensical. And we've done this at various points in history. So Marcel Duchamp, of course, famously delivered this urinal to the art show in 1917 in Paris. And this was his entry, his as-found urinal, the pissoir. And you can look at something like Eugene Ionesco and the play Rhinoceros, first performed in 1959, in which a town in France, bit by bit, has all of its residents turn into rhinoceroses. And it's, it's a protest against totalitarianism. This was the continual, absurdism was a, a pushback against totalitarianism. And even in the 1970s, we see surrealism al alive and well in the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, a film by Luis uh, Buñal. And I think these are important because of the ways they play with uncanniness. And we, of course, know about the idea of the uncanny valley that Masahiro Mori wrote about in 1970, the eeriness we feel when robots are too similar to us. And what Mori wrote in 1970 in an article in Energy Magazine in Japan is we should begin to build an accurate map of the uncanny valley so that through robotics research, we can come to understand what makes us human. And I think this notion of understanding what makes us human is vital, especially because of disembodied baby heads. So let me ask this, what can design then do for AI? Apparently, you can get your own uh, AI, so-called AI uh, brand made. You can get a logo made. It's not very good. Um, or you could have something like me, apparently, the AI version of your new web designer. And um, this massively offensive ad says, she's quirky but will never ghost you. Never charge more, never miss a deadline, never cower to your demands for a bigger logo. So sure, AI and design can do these things. But I'd like to suggest something else. I think that design brings to AI a new way of reframing the question and rethinking our relationships to technology. And in fact, rethinking our expectations of AI and our expectations of design. There's a lot at stake. And I'm really happy that Kathy O'Neill is speaking next because she's, I think, going to talk somewhat about what is at stake. But there are things like funding and defense funding, capital, power, agendas, Oprah. <laughs> Clichés only go so far. And these problems are very hard to solve. AI needs designers. Design needs AI, and AI needs us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have a few questions oh, for you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I have a couple of questions <laughs> after seeing your talk. First of all, um, it looks like we've done everything before. So you showed us the uh, iPad from the 60s. And, uh, <laughs> the iPad from the iPad from, the, <laughs> from now. Uh, you have Google Maps on a video disk. Are we just rehashing the same thing? Are we reinventing the wheel again? Or what's going on? Why are we feeling like all these things are new when they are actually just a newer version of something that's been done before? I feel like I should say, no, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, we have done it before, and I think it's important to look at where these ideas come from, but we haven't done it with unlimited, effectively unlim unlimited storage, massive bandwidth, and mobility, and miniaturization. So 
now different kinds of things are available. One of the problems for designers is that the toolkits for most people, there's, there's just simply not a way in to work with algorithms, um, to work with the material, to make, as uh, my colleagues John Zimmerman and Jody Forlisi say, to make AI material for design. But I want to argue that designers and architects do more than window dressing and, and pretty making. We actually frame questions for people. And so that's actually quite important. And in that sense, it hasn't been done before. And the framing that we do is more important than ever. So you show us uh, the history of AI, and I see a lot of old white guys. Yeah. Um, how can we make sure <laughs> that AI now doesn't have, because there's a lot of discussion yeah. now, does AI yeah. have an inherent bias? Is it made by white men for white men? How can we make it different this yeah. time around? Can we expect designers to, to make AI diverse? Can we, can, we, can we expect equality or not? I think that one of the important aspects is bringing designers into the data collection process, into the mechanisms for um, how, the, into the, the questions of bias and representation in what will even be in a data set, and into questions of training algorithms. So I point out the more amusing, um, the amusing examples of recipes or place names or color names, but I, I think they're important because without those examples we don't have unusual ideas about how to shake things up mm. yeah. and how to open things up. So AI needs us. We should really take that to heart as we can all affect AI in the future. Yes, yeah. and particularly when you're considering the top level domain and um, the perspective from Sweden, I would point out that um, there's a lot to be done here with the people in the room and then there's a lot more to be done by people who aren't in the room. Mm. And so my challenge here would be, how do you make that happen? How do you make it happen? Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank Molly. We have a, um, oh. a gift for you. This is a, a cute little robot, uh, but if you do hook it up, it will probably take over your house and destroy everything. Oh, think this is going <laughs> to terrify my dog. This is great. It's Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. So.